Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's live coverage here at Supercomputing 2024, SC24. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante, my co-host. Of course, we run the pod, the CUBE podcast, every Friday. Check it out, all the long-form commentary of the industry. Two great CUBE alumni, and a lot of the brain trust behind the success of the Dell AI success here at Supercomputing Ehab, and Arun uh, Ehab is obviously the SVP CTO of AI Compute and Networking at Dell, and Arun is SVP Portfolio Manager for Computing. Guys, first of all, Great to see you again, and congratulations on a, a great show. Dell really brought out the game, A game today and this show this week. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excited. Yeah, we've had a lot of conversations in the past three years here at SC and other places. The work's been in progress, so it, you know it's a lot of hard work to get here, so it's a good day to celebrate when you bring out the good, the good goods, and you got the factory, and you got the real high performance. Take us through, guys, the, the a couple of years back, what was the catalyst? Take us through how we got here real quick as context, because I think it's super important to know that this just doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, I mean, like we said before, it's exciting to see it and feel it. This is the kind of show where people want to see something, and we made tremendous progress. Uh, three years ago, we started to work about on scalable systems, which is what you have on the floor now, and we wanted to be much bigger player in HPC as well as AI. We took a different path than most people. We decided to build a fully open system based on OCP specs, v 3 21 inch, and also DCMHS for the compute and fully open on software. And we also wanted this to be the most dense and it's totally best in performance and a fully open system. So that 21 inch, if I could just follow up on that, we saw that in your lab. My understanding is, some manufacturers, some silicon manufacturers want to go wider, some want to go deeper, some want to go both, and so you said, this is, a, is this, this is an OCP, I don't want to say mandate, but that's their sort of recommended spec, right? So you can accommodate virtually anything, is that correct? Yeah, OCP specs, we're fully compliant with OCP specs, which means anybody can build to it and we're able to accommodate the ecosystem. However, we did modifications, as you said, what you saw in the lab, to make it much more operationally easy. So all the cabling is easy to do, it supports all the power, it supports the manifolds for liquid cooling in a very simple way with quick disconnects. So the portfolio is not so simple anymore. No, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> so I, I think what the way we've thought about our portfolio, right, is we want to build rack scalable systems, which are, the way I think about rack scalable systems is threefold, right? It's designed by Dell, yeah. engineered by Dell, manufactured by Dell and supported by Dell. That's what you need to think about what a rack scalable system is. And the way we've designed this is, we want to support all customer use cases. Liquid cooled in 21 inch ORV3 standards, liquid cooled in 19 inch, so there are customers who will have brownfield data centers and we'll have 19 inch data centers. We'll have liquid cooled there. And then finally air cooled, because there's a portion of the enterprise that is still going to be air cooled. And we've, we built rack scalable systems for all three scenarios and all three customer types. Well, I think what's interesting about the last thing you said is, we all, I get excited about liquid cooling, and again, I get the lab tours, <laughs> you get pumped up about AI, but. I like air cooling, and I like cooling then, on chip, well, actually. Well, cooling on chip is pretty cool. But, and well, and I, yes it is, especially direct to chip. <laughs> but, if I'm a CIO, I'm like, I'm here today, and I'm at point A, and I want to get to point B, and I don't have a billion dollars to spend on getting there, and hiring a bunch of consultants, so how can I take, how can I get a leverage out of my existing infrastructure, which is air cooled? Yep. So you have an answer for that. We do. <clears throat> I'll tell you this too, right? I mean, if you think of our existing data center, somebody has a brownfield data center, if you move from our 14th generation server to our 17th generation server, you get a seven to one consolidation. So you can create space in your existing data center to put AI workloads in it, in an air pool phenomenon. So we are building infrastructure that allows for all customer types to scale. That's what we are trying to do. So on the on the on this rack system that you guys have is integrated rack scalable solution. That's the kind of the, the category. Yep. Dell engineer, Dell made, so all that innovation. I mean, what jumped out at me was was the OCP compliant because obviously Dave, remember we did the first ever yes. OCP. I spoke. Uh, AD Fessenstein was there, <laughs> uh, and and it was the beginning of open source infrastructure. And I can't tell you how many times we've had conversations here in the queue with you guys and others around the debate between open and closed. Now, open Ethernet, for instance, is hot as, as hot as can be, because why there's an ecosystem? Yep. Open source, and, and the other thing I want to get your reaction to, guys, if you don't mind, is the term we've been hearing on theCUBE. I feel like I'm back in the 90s, which at that time was an inflection point for infrastructure. Yep. Open systems kicked in, and that changed everything. We're at a, that new wave here, it's like the old chapter is over. How important is open? Because you mentioned it a few times, we're hearing open source, you see all the open source models, 
open compute project, which the rack is now fully compliant with. Why is that such a big deal? I want to get your opinion as, as leaders at Dell. Yeah, I, I will start. As you said correctly, open, open source, both hardware and software, have been a catalyst for innovation. I would say this cycle now with AI, innovation is happening at 5x the speed that we've ever seen before, both from software, new models, new optimized models, smaller models, as well as hardware, new accelerators. And that's not hyperbole, that's like real. That's what's happening. Yeah, that's the data, right? Yeah, <laughs> and there's no way to do something like that easily if you don't allow full industry innovation. So an open system means people can innovate on CDUs, they can innovate on network, they can innovate on Ethernet, GPU, CPU, and have a blueprint to write to it. So if you're one of the silicon companies, you know you're gonna design for OCP specs to speed up adoption. Or liquid cooling companies know what quick disconnects look like, for example. It's such a big deal now, given the massive explosion of innovation. But and, ju and just for the record, CDUs is the coolant distribution unit, unit right? right? Yes, so which is part of the liquid got, cooling yeah. system. But, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, I get that. But Dell is a very pragmatic company. <laughs> and you know, Michael drives frugality throughout the company. So when you have to support all those different you know, options, that puts a lot of pressure on, yeah. on you guys. So was there ever a point of a conversation inside the company about, well, maybe if we go more homogeneous, you know, it'll be easier for us. It'll be, it'll save, you know, be more efficient that way versus, I mean, it, it really puts a lot of pressure on you. How did you think yeah, about that? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this, right? It, it goes, you said, Michael, right? It goes back to our history and heritage, right? We have been an open standards company from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the challenge to us was you need to hit open standards and you need to hit time to market. So it's, it, you have to do both. You get don't have, get a choice of one or the other. Yeah. So <laughs> we worked really hard, I mean, like uh, to pick open standards first, no, no, no compromise on the base principle. And then we started figuring out how to innovate really fast. We've changed almost every process in our company to hit the inflection points of the market, right? So our product development cycles used to take 18 months to two years to develop a server. We're in six month cycles. Sometimes you're developing products in four months. We have changed every ecosystem in the company to make this happen. But we will not compromise on the principles of open standards yeah. and time to market. That's our core tenet. So how did you do that? Was that new skilling? Was that new tooling? Was that new training? It, well, it was a combination of things, right? First, we need to have one buying from everybody in the company to do that, right? So that we got from Michael's blessing and everybody else's direction. We had to change our process. So EHA built a team out called a CTO pod team. Those pod teams are looking and talking to customers and giving us requirements real time. And we've worked with the engineering to build new capabilities yeah to build products really fast, right? So it was process, technology, and all of the manufacturing in the back end to change in order to make this happen. So complete retooling yeah. of our company has been. You yeah. actually took the process and reconstructed it for today's modern era yeah. with insight and action tied together as quick as possible. To go Giant. 5X faster. Yeah, and I also led from a technologies perspective, we've designed the system to be modular with building blocks you know, instead of building every single server as a standalone platform, and every, now you have building blocks and form factors, and you can respond to the market very quickly by picking these building blocks of modular components and put them together. That's what sped up the product development engineering process by a, a significant factor. And this way, we're all, also able to respond to some of the largest AI customers with some customization that's needed and is fun to the market. Ah, I mean, right. So that's because enterprises still want customization. Yeah. So this is, again, this interesting tension. Hey, you want things to be standard, but then enterprises say, well, I want, if, if you do this, you'll get the order. Yeah, and so, <laughs> yeah we're disciplined about the customization we do. So we usually go after customization if we think it's going to benefit the majority or a large segment of customer. And then, as Arun was saying, we built it into the product development process to adjust our roadmap dynamic. So if it's a snowflake, you kind of, we probably will. Yeah, we wouldn't do every snowflake out there, yeah. right? I mean, so that's that's how we are, we are choosing and being deliberate about it. And that's based upon intentional known use cases you think that are going to be bigger or? Customer unique. use cases and which we believe will scale into large scale volume and revenue, right? So yeah. that's how Yeah, the think. change, I will go back to what Arun has said, is think of it as faster response to customer input. 
because the speed of innovation also means customer input is coming faster. So working upfront with the yeah. customers, designing these systems yeah. for them, we design the network, the storage, cooling, data center design, system design, we pull all that input, and then quickly we recognize the patterns that customers are asking for, feed it into the product and engineering yeah. to update and be nimble. So two major vectors, broadly, and within them, I'm sure there are a lot of patterns, but the, the first being the big LLM vendors, you know, the big five, you yeah. know who those are, I think you sell to, you sell to many of them, I'm not sure or if you've named names, but whatever, we know you're selling to some of them. And then the enterprises, the, the Jamie Diamonds of the world with yeah. 150 petabytes that are going to be, you know, unique. They're going to need an right. AI factory. So, okay, so you, <laughs> now you have to have a portfolio that, so you only have five on this side, and then maybe there's five others that are sort of small versions of that, and then you got tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands on the other side, so you've got to accommodate both. So I wonder if you could speak to the patterns that you see there and how you're engineering to them. Yeah, great question, right? So, so when we see the, the product development cycle and the market itself, think of the enterprise customers, right? I mean, the ones, the JP Morgans, they are still going to do inferencing. Some of them are middle, small scale models, but the yeah. inferencing is the main use case, right? And what we see is they are going to be on PCIe technology, right? So if you look at our floor, we built two new PCIe platforms called the 7740 and the 7745 for precisely that use case. You can put eight double weight GPUs inside it, you can start small and you can scale up. So for those people, we built those platforms. And on the other extreme side of it, for the big large LLM models, we have the GB200 NVL72 in a 21 inch rack design, right? So our goal here has been to enable the AI portfolio to scale to all types of customers. And second point, I think you have made a really important point, how do we do that? It's because we built our servers on DCMHA standards, so I can take some of these building blocks from this small server and use it in the largest server. So it, it increases our design. Reusability is leverage. Reusability is leverage. Oh it's man, uh, great operating leverage. And that's how we've been able to deliver to the market. So what else are you speeding up at Dell? How's the product launches and the, I mean, have you matched the entire end-to-end -end product life cycle? I mean, I mean, it sounds like a sea change culturally for Dell. It's a complete cultural change, but also when you look at our roadmap, We've tried to cover every aspect of where we think the AI market right. is going to go, right? I mean, all the way from the smaller scale to the medium scale to the large scale. Yeah. And our product, right, the 9680, was a single product, which is the most, most successful yeah. product in the history of Dell. I'm hoping that the next five products we built right now on the show floor yeah. are just as successful <laughs> or even more successful. You know, yeah, we've talked about this in the past, and we talked about it a little bit early in our, our segment earlier in the day. In every wave, this, things change so fast that so much, the next version comes out, but you look at the PC revolution on the processor side and, and memory, some of its components, but mainly processor, it was always backwards compatible. So it got better, but it still worked together. So having module designs and open standards kind of ensures that interoperability and, and backward compatibility. But every, with the AI, it was a little bit different. You had transformer technology come out that kind of made all those algorithms that I used to do in the 80s relevant, okay? Yeah. And now a new architecture emerged, for, and then new software came yeah. that we've never seen before. Now the new architecture with factories, what software do you guys see coming to take advantage of this goodness? Because when you have, and by the way, it's not just on-prem, because all the top customers want to connect to the cloud too, so it's distributed computing. So yeah. not so much on-prem cloud battle anymore, it's more, hey, I just want the big iron on-premise because that's where my action is, my IP is or so I might connect to the cloud for some customization or just do it all here. So what's that software, the next software coming that you can squint through this current setup? Because you know, ChatGPT set the table, we see some rag out there, we see some nice automation, process improvement. What's the next set of software coming from the entrepreneurs, from the enterprises? Because the enterprise only has like 1% penetration on AI. No, very good question. And I agree with you completely. We talk so much about hardware, but the innovation in software and the ecosystem and what we're doing there is probably just as big of a story, if not bigger. Uh, a couple of things there. We have been consistently working on in the new software ecosystem. AI is a new system of software companies. It is incremental to the software ecosystem we had before. So we've talked before about hugging face. All the containers almost come from there as models. We've we're the only company on-prem partnering with Hugging Face right now. We built an enterprise hub, very close to Meta. We presented at Connect. We implemented Llama Stack. We have all the capabilities. Again, we're unique in our partnership with Meta. 
we are going to announce two or three more software companies, but we see five, six software companies uh, all coming out. You should think about it this way. Or many of the big customers who buy our platforms are also software companies. Yeah. So when they're training the software on our platforms, that means we can easily take that and go to market with them yeah. with all our customers. So we will continue to build that ecosystem, which is critical. Arun, yeah. oh, go ahead. No, go, please. Arun, because you know, I talked to you guys in the past about the, the future, it's like three years ago, I said, you know, the developer in the old days was, everything was local host on your Mac or PC, and then you just upload to the cloud or you buy a box and provision it and then hope it works. And you, now the servers, the clusters of that are the developer platform. Yep. So, you know, developers would just buy a PC and that's fine. The AI factory seems like it's the same thing. So these developers, they need big iron, they need inference. Absolutely. So how are you looking at that developer market? Because if you're going to have that software ecosystem, those developers have to have easy codability as if it's their machine. This is going to be, I think, a hot area for the innovation. What's your thoughts on developers? What are you guys doing? How are you making the provision of that infrastructure, whether it's a rack and a, a shared factory <laughs> or <laughs> dedicated factory? I mean. But it's a question, I'm going to need more horsepower to yep. run my models. Is it going to be the, the new PowerEdge server with the four H200s? I and mean, that's a pretty big server. Yeah, I mean, it would be any of those things, right? I mean, uh, the way we are thinking about it is the developers will have our platforms available to them. And, and the key point is this is, the AI factory is designed to be a solution, right? It has the software layer built in so developers can develop on it. And we want to engineer it out of the factory that it's a ready solution that they can do it. Think of the old days, you'd get a, a PC all set up so you can develop on it. We're developing an AI factory that's coming to your data center all ready to develop. It's like a developer cloud. It's a developer cloud, but on right? On-prem developer cloud. Yeah, a developer resource. Thinking. Yeah. Oh, better, better way, better Developer factory. Yeah. Can we, uh, <laughs> inside the AI factory. Can we talk about networking yeah. for a moment? So at Mobile World Congress or MWC, I never, you know, I never really thought about Dell as a networking company, but now that Dell's an AI company, Networking has become this new bottleneck. A article in the Wall Street Journal today talking about replumbing the data center. I thought it was going to be about liquid cooling, but no, it was about mm -hmm. networking. But there's a new type of networking architecture emerging that you guys are, all of a sudden it's become a tailwind for you. I wonder if you could explain that a little bit. Yeah, we talked about networking before us here. Very exciting topic for me. I think networking is the most important element in performance of an AI system. So we've been extremely in, involved in networking. Today we have big partnerships with the big silicon providers and we're expanding them more and more. Now, in addition to all the great work and all the collaboration we continue to do with Broadcom, we're also working with NVIDIA as well, who is a great networking company and has very good solutions for AI. So with both of them, we are we're designing switches, optics, and now we started to deliver to some of the big customers everything from uh, structured cabling to a fully designed systems. We install, test. For the most part, you said it correctly. Network has become part of the system. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is it's not independent anymore. For most of the players, we're doing both. And the same OCP open specs that you saw here, we're going to take all of that to networking. and and drive tremendous innovation in the networking space with the same innovation we did for compute. But if the networking doesn't work in the AI factory, it may not be the biggest cost item compared to say the GPUs, but it's a critical failure oh, point. It's, it's a critical explain, performance implication. Right? Explain this, because this is one of the biggest things, all the networking guys and gals know this, but we got to keep this in mind that GPUs, they're designed for job completion. Yeah. Not yeah. jitter and slowdown, right? I mean, like. Well, Explain the, why this is such an important feature not to be overlooked. I think there's two things about networking not to be overlooked. One, if you don't tune the network at the software with the communication libraries, let's say you're running 80% utilization GPU to GPU, that means you're leaving 20% of your GPU capacity idle. If you paid 100 million for a system, that's like a $20 million price tag. We've tuned our network now at 97% throughput on those links, almost at line speed. The second one, with these big models, and even for inferencing, if you lose one GPU because of network, the whole system training stops. So you lose 
the entire cycle. It doesn't matter how big the cluster is. And then you have to go checkpoint, save the model, start it. Yeah. So one network failure on one optics will stop the whole job. That makes it very yeah, critical. And that restart, by the way, is a complete more GPUs to redo everything. Exactly. So wow, and optics fail. So, yeah. I mean. And think of it. You have a $100 million system and optic costs $1,000, right? Yeah. So the yeah. proportion of <laughs> impact is, is, is it's significant. Yeah. It's like uh, the connection on. integrity in the hose. Yeah, kind of, yeah uh, exactly. Is it, is it, <laughs> Excellent example. You've got to knock those, pro those little problems down because they can make big problems. So you want people who are building those systems highly reliable. Right? Yeah. All right, guys, you guys are really rocking the show. Final question. Um, what are you most proud about from the performance to getting this point? Obviously, you're getting great reviews here at the show. What is the, the thing you guys are most proud of that people may not know or may know or, or share, uh, share uh, a cool thing? I'll tell you what I'm most proud about and then Eav can tell him what he's most proud of. You, I don't know if you also on Sunday evening, Michael tweeted the GB200 NVL72, the first in the world. Yeah. I mean, that's an incredibly pride, proud moment for us, right? I mean, like we have worked on that and ahead of everybody else, ahead of um, any other company out there doing it first in the world, that made me really proud as a product manager. I don't know what he up thinks. I said they look like the thing from Star Trek, that big yeah. machine that just ran everything. Yeah. 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 I, <laughs> I, I agree with Arun. That moment may look like a simple statement, but what it took, it's not just we had the first NVL72 GB200, it's not just deployed, the running workload on all 72 GPUs in an open rack. Very unique. That took three years of work to get to this point. Okay, so now the inside baseball question. How long was the line to get access to it? Was it like, everyone dream beat down, pick me, I want to run my workload on it? I mean, that's a dream. That's like getting the new car first, right? Like, come on. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm going to answer a different question. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of, we have, we have a, a large number of customers who are working with us. Okay, it's customers, yeah. And okay. we're happy to get early <laughs> access to all of them. Every, we have hundreds of people who want to get their hands on that thing. <laughs> uh, <but laughs> well, I, everyone's you know, your new best friend, right? Exactly. <laughs> this, this show is amazing. It's like GTC for open systems. And yeah. GTC was a watershed moment for Dell with Michael in the front row. You were actually there. I don't know if room. I wasn't there. But yeah, I remember yeah, seeing you on the screen. I'm like, oh my God, look at that. And then, but that was really a turning point, I yeah. think, just perception wise about Dell and and I think it it motivated a lot of people internally it was a really flashpoint for the company and now it's just up and away so all right the game starts what's next Aru what are you going to work on now what's next for you I think you have hit it up on there's three areas we're really focused on uh, I'll start with networking I mean we are going to spend a lot of time on networking second you all see a lot here uh, on cooling cooling technologies how to mm -hmm. kind of yeah. innovate and go faster and go there even more and then the next generation of AI platforms. Right? These are the three things I'm really working on in that order, right? I mean, yeah. getting networking right is really important. Getting cooling right is very important. And then we just launched current generation. We're going to work on next generation of AI technologies. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. New software partners and more of an easy button for software yeah. for customers everywhere as part of AI Factory. It's going to be really exciting by the time we get to Dell Tech World. Number two, I would say networking. But also, we're building the most advanced storage servers with very dense media, very good connectivity. We're building storage media specifically for AI with everything we're learning. And then you're going to see us announce more and more big yeah. customers and see. great collaboration. Well, we want to talk to them. We're, gonna do, we're doing our job here on the Cube Factory. We're going to do our digital twin of the SC24 in Palo Alto and the New York Stock Exchange. We'll see a lot more editorial content come on this topic. We want to showcase the customers that have the use cases. There's a real appetite for who my peers are doing, what are best practices. A lot of choice involved, a lot of architecture being done. So again, congratulations on a great factory model, AI factory. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thanks you guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, we love the leaders at Dell making the AI factory reality, of course, the rackable integrated systems are really the key. And of course, you got to have the GPUs and the machines and the process and the networking. Of course, theCUBE is here. Day two, stay with us for tomorrow, day three. Thanks for joining. Good boy, I have a good plan.